Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by MailChimp. Manage lists with 2,000 subscribers and send up to 12,000 emails per month for free with MailChimp. And by ShareFile from Citrix, secure file transfer built for business. Visit sharefile.com, click on the microphone, and enter Twist for a free 30-day trial. And by AWS Activate. It's easy to start and scale your business with Amazon Web Services. Check out free resources like one-on-one office hours with AWS Solutions Architects and much more. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, and it's This Week in Startups. Today, uh, two great uh, journalists on the program, Declan McCullough, formerly of CNET now uh, with Recent.io, and Amir Afradi is making his debut Uh, here on This Week in Startups. He's from the information formerly of the Wall Street Journal. We have a lot to talk about. A lot happened this week. Uh, Stick with us. It's going to be an amazing episode. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't going to live like people until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. We're here on This Week in Startups, the podcast, video show, web show, whatever. I mean, do we even call them podcasts anymore? I don't know. It's, it's a show. And we're here on the show twice a week, Monday, uh, Tuesdays and Fridays, 1 p.m. Pacific. On Tuesday, we do an interview with some really important founder, VC, thinker, et cetera. And uh, then on Friday, we do the News Roundtable. And the News Roundtable is a lot of fun because we get to talk about a lot of topics with a lot of smart people. Uh, back on the program, a, a big crowd favorite, Declan McCullough, is here, formerly of CNET, now running Recent.io, which you can go take a look at. He's also trying to solve the mobile news space. Not an easy task. Uh, it, more difficult than I thought going in. <laughs> You're right. Um, and so h- how do you like the uh, jump from being a... Uh, journalist who actually making stuff. Well, I was a programmer before I was a yeah, journalist, and right. so now I've, I've switched back. I've been out of CNET about a month, uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of weird going into meetings. Uh, you're on the other side now, uh, and uh, I'm still getting used to it. Very cool. Uh, Amir Afradi is with us as well. Uh, you're at The Information, mm-hmm. and you left the Wall Street Journal after nine years to join The Information. Why? I mean, aren't you supposed to end at the Wall Street Journal? Isn't that like the brass yeah, ring? And you that's just what it, gave that's it what up? That's what it used to be, yeah. yeah. That's what it used Explain to be. Explain why you left. Uh, there are better opportunities elsewhere. Um, I'm really happy with my decision. Best decision I ever made to go join a startup uh, and do something new. Uh, no politics. No politics is great. Don't have to worry about New York, Washington, other bureaus. You just write what you want to write. Um, ah, so a little more freedom as a journalist. A lot more freedom. A lot ah. more freedom. Uh, great new colleagues, and we believe in the model very strongly, subscription model as a sustainable model for the future. But unless I pay, I don't get to see anything. I get maybe like one paragraph at Co- the beginning. A couple paragraphs, it. maybe, if you're, if you're lucky. If you're lucky, it's a I'll give you my login um, later, don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, I won't do that. Um, but it's 400 bucks a year. Yeah, or about a dollar a day. And yeah. you guys have uh, 2,400 subscribers so far. Is that what you were told? <laughs> if you do the math, that's uh, that's quite good. That's quite good. No, not yet. I can see. I'm just. It's my little poker thing. I'm just kind of like <laughs> seeing if you thought that was high or low. I think that's a little high, but I think you're well over it. I'm guessing over a thousand, but okay. not quite two. What do you? Am I close? Interesting. Interesting. What are there? Ten people working on it? Uh, we've got eight total. Eight journalists. For the no, not eight journalists. Uh, we're basically uh, about five five writers, one full time editor. Uh, so. Five writers, one full-time matter, yeah. six people. In Let's the just say our, our networks are very good. So we're, yeah, no, you we're, guys are strong. We're not worried about the, the business model. So you got about 10 people on the total team. Uh, eight people. Eight team people team. total. Yeah, yeah. Which means it's like a million-dollar business to run, which means you've only got to get to 2,000 or so subscribers to hit break-even. Um, I guess. That's that's one person's math, for sure. Yeah. yeah. What, what, Back what, to the envelope. It, it's, a, it's a good business. It's you good believe business. it will get there. You believe it will be a profitable business. Uh, who's to say it's not already profitable? Ah, very good. Okay, there we go. So, uh, well, that's the big question. It's only six months old, right? Uh, four months, yeah. Four months old, right? So it's doing pretty good. I mean, I bought a subscription. Sure, why not? Hey, thanks to our friends at WeWork for hosting us here. Uh, WeWork, Golden Gate, great place to go. Gorgeous offices, great coffee, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I think they're sold out anyway here, so I don't think there's any desks. I don't know why I'm reading the ad. Yeah, you know, and, uh, but I do thank them for building me my awesome studio here in San Francisco, and they're just great, great people. Go to WeWork.com. I think they're actually adding another location. I'm not probably not supposed to talk about that, but they keep adding locations. That company's growing real quick. I wish I was an investor in that. Um, if you want to join the uh, back channel, go to twistlist.co, and you can join the email list where we all hang out. 
All right, let's uh, start off with the big news. Heartbleed uh, has yanked the guts out of web security. It attacks SSL encryption, potentially leaking passwords. Yahoo and OkCupid okay among uh, the high profile sites affected. A patch fixed it, but it took some time to implement. And today, Bloomberg reports, our friends at the NSA have known about this bug, I'm using air quotes for those of you listening on Swell or Stitcher and not watching the video, um, and they've been using it for years to get information downside of open source. Uh, Declan, it's kind of your, oh wait, did you write about it? Yeah, we've been writing about You've it too. You've been writing about it, so yeah. who wants to go first? I think, it's up to you. I, you Amir, I, you're new to the program. I'll just have a couple of points. First of all, I don't think it's news that the uh, NSA uses bugs in, in open source software. Is uh, it a bug or did they put it in there? Uh, no, they did not put it in there. Uh, a, a gentleman, there, right? a gentleman from from Germany, has claimed responsibility for this uh, for this mistake. Um, what What's amazing? It's, it's amazing how it takes the you know the biggest bug in internet history to to realize that it's not a good idea to have only one full time developer on such a key critical piece of software. Um, and I think it's really incumbent upon the big web companies to pony up some money and really figure this out, not just for Open SSL, but uh, for any other uh, critical software, wh whether it's Apache or, or Linux, yeah. and really fund this stuff um, properly. We, properly, and and also maybe we should come up with some new mechanisms that that really ensure that uh, code is where it needs to be. Maybe there's a new form of cyber insurance uh, that that companies can have, um, and more incentives to really make make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, Declan, uh, open source, um, maybe people overestimated the stability of it a little bit in the security space. What do you think? Well, I mean, it, it's not, it's like democracy, you know, it's not perfect, but what's better? Yeah. Uh, there's, I, I don't think it's, it's any surprise uh, that the, the NSA has been exploiting this, uh, but think of what could have happened in the, in, um, but the question is, who else is exploiting this? What other malicious actors are exploiting this? Is sure. it the uh, Chinese government and of its course. military? I'd be surprised if they, uh, yeah. if they aren't. And so the NSA could have done this if the Bloomberg is, um, report is correct. Uh, four years ago, it could have said, hey, you know, there's a problem, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and Instead of, try, of fulfilling its mandate to lock us down and secure our data, they instead went with uh, its, it, the competing surveillance mandate, which is to try to exploit this. Uh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying basically if they're here to protect us, protect us but you're kind of using it as a weapon against us. Well, the NSA has, has two yeah. mandates. Uh, yeah. there, uh, one mandate is, is to help strengthen U.S. Uh, government and, to some extent, uh, corporate communications hardened against espionage. Right. And the other mandate is to spy. And so these, this, this is why some folks are talking about ripping the NSA up into parts, because the, they, they, the two mandates are really uh, incompatible at some level. Uh, but, but also, there's, I, I, I do want to say, uh, it, we might have been exaggerating, we in, in the media, how bad this is to a small extent. I mean, if you look at the site that um, Cloudflare set up today, cloudflarechallenge.com, uh, uh, they're making the point that it's very implementation dependent, how bad this bug is, how much it exposes. They're right. saying, uh, look, we're running an unpatched version of OpenSSL, try to hack into our servers and ex extract the key. So far, uh, as of the last I checked, nobody's mm. been able to do it yet. Ah, so we, we haven't determined exactly how bad this is, a known bug. Um, but with open source, at least the bug gets identified, generally speaking, very quickly and resolved very quickly. Depends. I mean, I, th I still think there are plenty of sites that are not protected and have not made this this change yet. And also, I mean, if you think about something as important as Heroku, right, with Amazon and, and how many websites rely on Heroku, I think it took 14 hours um, mm -hmm. for that to get fixed. You know, 14 hours is a relatively short amount of time, um, but it's also a long period of time where a lot could happen in between. And also, you know, we shouldn't forget that. Um, I mean, that the bigger point here is if you're if you're using these cloud server systems, right? That's that's part of the issue. It, it may take longer for your issues to get resolved since you're depending on somebody else as opposed to if you have your own server but, but, but it might be faster. I'm, I'm for, for recent.io, I'm using Google App Engine uh, mm -hmm. for the back end, and I was happy to check that um, that it was patched instantly. If I were if I were doing that part of my Go service myself... Google had a head start. That they did. did. But but I wouldn't have had a head start if I were, if I were doing um, what do you mean, running my Google, own back end. The Google employees working at the NSA told them two years no, ago? No, but Go Google has been working on patching this stuff yeah. uh, before everyone else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think what, didn't one of, one of their engineers or cryptographers... That's right. They, were the one, they, they co-discovered uh, the it, vulnerability. On April 1st, that's right. That's right. Ah, okay, so they got a little, a little job. But yeah, my, I have a sysadmin, it got to it pretty quick, so. But uh, everybody changing their passwords now. So for people who are consumers, when they see this, and just generally in password security, I, what, what's the best practice? Should everybody, you think, be just rushing and going to two-factor authentication? That's the first thing I did, was, you know, I, I used a bunch of 
you know, services that have two-factor, and I'm just going to force everybody in my company to start using two-factor for everything. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I, I've been swearing all day because I've been changing my passwords over the past couple of days. It's been uh, it's been very annoying. But I really want to be in the room. I want to be a fly on the wall uh, for the next. Uh, there's something called the Enduring Security Framework. It's a public-private uh, uh, program where the NSA actually meets with a lot of web companies on a regular basis, uh, including Google. I'd love to be fly on the wall for the next meeting as they what probably... What is that called again? It's called the Enduring Security Framework. We, we wrote Enduring a... Enduring Security Framework. ESF, yeah, yeah. We, wow. we wrote a couple of long pieces about this program. It's These are top secret meetings, uh, so uh, executives... Not anymore if you wrote them on. Uh, well, the, the, they're still, the, the, the existence is known, but the details of what happens there is, is top secret. Uh, but what's interesting is you have people like Sergey Brin who've gone in the past to these meetings who, who go to the NSA at Fort Meade and actually have these discussions. Uh, and so I'm, I'm sure th these open source questions are, are, are going to be part of the next, uh, the next meeting discussion. Declan, this is dovetail in any way to like sort of snowed in and that sort of issues of spying, or is it just sort of something else that's on the outside? I, I th we're all hyper aware of it. I mean, it's been almost a year since... Uh, uh, we, we heard the name Edward Snowden. I mean, it was, I think, the first week of June of last year. Uh, and uh, and so then the natural response is, uh, first, did the NSA insert this? And as you said, there's, there's no evidence that that, that happened. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of hard this, to do if it was open source. Uh, or you subvert someone. I mean, we've, we've seen a bunch of stories last fall based on the Snowden do docs uh, and other uh, interviews saying that uh, the NSA is, appears to be subverting some of the cryptographic uh, standards pr uh, processes. Right. Uh, and so uh, it, when you have NSA employees or contractors chairing or co-chairing some of the standards committees and, and, and then the standards become weakened, it's, it's not a smoking gun, but it's suggestive. Uh, so uh, the, the the, bo the bottom line is I, I, I think we're um, all hypersensitive to this and that uh, finally we might be taking this more seriously. L look at all the money that's being spent on browser development. Uh, how about server, server uh, security development? Yeah. All right, let's talk about Bitcoin. That's the next big story, I think, in the news for me at least. Uh, Bitcoin's below $400. I mean, if we're here right around Thanksgiving, we're talking about $1,200, $1,300. Um, I guess on the China markets, maybe the high in the U.S. markets was more like 1,100, or I have here in my notes 1,132. Uh, but Chinese banks received official notices saying, "Hey, no uh, Bitcoin deposits," uh, and sent it down 10%. What, what do you What do you think, Amir? Is this um, the Are we beginning? To, is this the beginning of the end of Bitcoin, or is this like the the bottom and we're going to start climbing again? You know, it's hard for me to to speak very specifically about Bitcoin because I'm not yet sold on this being the um, the only cryptocurrency of, of choice for the future. So we're just having a discussion about this in the office, but um, we're, we're in the beginning of this space. Yeah. Uh, the, and there's no doubt um, that, that uh, currencies like Bitcoin are going to be uh, very useful and very necessary in the future. But Why is there no doubt? Um, because you, you don't always need uh, you know, lots of third parties involved in, in transactions. I, I, don't, I don't think there's, there's any reason for that in, in this you know, global, global world, universal world that we live in. Uh, we can communicate uh, so easily. Um, so there, there is value to having uh, this kind of currency, but uh, you know, nobody has, has proven to me that Bitcoin is it. Um, you yeah. know, th there are other methods, uh, you know, Dogecoin and Litecoin and other methods of, of mining, uh, you know, th these currencies that are probably less harmful to the environment, for example. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the, the Fed uh, and, and government agencies here in the United States have talked about the usefulness uh, of these kind of currencies, but they've never singled out Bitcoin as like, you know, this is actually going to be it. Yeah. Declan, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin at this point? Well, I mean, look, uh, Bitcoin's been up four to five times uh, in the last year. So, uh, I mean, is this, is this good or bad? Depends on wh when you bought in. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. speculative. Uh, I, I, think, I think you're right. Uh, there's, uh, uh, well, let me rephrase. Uh, there's uh, some form of digital currency or electronic cash is uh, going to uh, take over the world at, at some point. I mean, this is hedged carefully. Uh, maybe some point is 50 years from now. I think right. it's probably closer to five or 10 a years from now. Currency. But not, not, uh, not unseating the current currencies. Eventually, right? probably. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't need to, they, they don't need to unseat completely. We don't, it doesn't mean we have to give up a Federal Reserve notes in our, in our wallets. Uh, but I mean, we're, we're already uh, using uh, uh, non-FRNs. Uh, we're using cre uh, credit cards or bank transfers for so much, um, so many transactions. Why do we care uh, what, what, what it's in? So I, I think, I think you're, you're going to be surprised in the, long, in the long run if governments let it happen. They're going to do, well, do their best. That's, that's a big question. It. I don't think they will let it happen. But why not? 
uh, governments will not, you know, willingly cede, cede control over yeah. something as important as currency. Uh, and it's only nice to be able to print money to fund, say, random invasions of uh, third yeah. world countries. Yeah, uh, right, exactly. Or, or to uh, make up for a couple of uh, people on Wall Street, like, crashing the market and, and saving some uh, exactly. big political donors' asses. Uh, but we do put a ton of money in gold. It seems to me the only use case I've heard, because I'm kind of thinking of it from a user perspective, like, there's no use case that's come out. So we have all this hype about using Bitcoin, but there's no use case. It's, it reminds me of Google Glass in a way, which is everybody's just fascinated by the technology of it, but mm -hmm. nobody can tell you what you do with it. And everybody who's bought it, and I ask them, what do you use it for? They say, well, uh, I check my email. I'm like, really? You check your email on that time? Like, well, I have checked my email, but I don't. It's more efficient right. here. And I, I guess I take pictures. Oh, do you, have you taken pictures? Well, I did one time when I was at the park with my kid. So like, nobody has a use case on a consumer basis. Or what, the only use case I've heard of for Bitcoin is money laundering, Silk Road drug kind of transactions, and money store, as in like, I'm afraid the currency is going to drop, so I'll just put money in something. So, do you guys have any idea of, a, of an actual well, use me, case besides throw, what I've thrown out? Let me throw two at you. I was at a Bitcoin conference uh, last year uh, when, I was, when I was still at CNET, and uh, folks uh, there were saying, um, some of the Bitcoin entrepreneurs, uh, startups were saying uh, that it, one of the best use, use cases they've seen is just mail order businesses, especially while well, I'm well, dealing with uh, physical shipments uh, to developed um, or le less developed nations, mm -hmm. dealing with chargebacks and credit cards. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they might ah. just, just cut off all of Africa yeah. and, and not send any, I think it was a guitar company. They're not going to send any guitars uh, to all of Africa. But with Bitcoin, they don't have to worry about credit card fraud. And here's yeah. another ah, one. Ah, that's, that's incredible. Um, so I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you two more. Bonus okay, one, okay, quickly. Okay. Uh, the first is, uh, if, you've, if you uh, talk to folks in Argentina, uh, as an example, I mean, they've dealt, they've dealt with uh, bank crashes, they've dealt with currency devaluations, they've dealt with inflation. I mean, if you can just shift your money into Bitcoin, that helps a lot. Gold would help as well, but Bitcoin might be a little easier. And, and the last would be, um, uh, what happens when Bitcoin starts to be, um, or something similar starts to be embedded into some of uh, the standards of the internet? I'm not, not talking web, but, but at a lower level. Right. In the standard stack, um, uh, things like API calls, I mean, maybe it's just one Satoshi, which is the currently the smallest unit that Bitcoin can be div um, divided yeah, into. Yeah, so you're paying for your MailChimp and getting credits, or exactly. which, uh, any Why service not? that you Hootsuite uses maybe credits. Yes, lookups. I don't or know. farm. Yeah, anything. So anytime I hit the server, I just pay whatever. Because right, right now it's kind Twilio. of it's 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 unmetered, but you pay for it uh, indirectly. Maybe it's, maybe paying for it directly is more efficient. Uh, okay. When we get back from commercial break, um, let's do um, our uh, launch of the week. We've got some pretty interesting launches coming up, and let me just take a moment to thank ShareFile uh, by Citrix. Thanks, guys uh, and gals over there for, I'm always trying to use non-gender specific words now. Like everybody- Be careful, is, be careful. Well, actually, you know what? I used to call everything a dude business, was my definition of a business that two dudes could set up and make a little bit of money. Actually, somebody else that told me that term, you know, two decades ago, like a VC who said like, yeah, we can't invest in that, it's a dude business. So now I'm trying to find a new word for just two people hanging out like dudes. But you know what I'm saying? Like sort of bros or just dudes hanging out making 10,000 from website. What should I use? Peeps? I don't know. Like I'm trying to figure out some way to just like sort of cavalier people. Gene, I can't see your notes over here for some reason. You're white on white text. Unfortunately, I want to hear your suggestion for this. Anyway, um, so my friends over at ShareFile, and you guys can think about that while I read the we'll uh, come back to you. awesome ad. Um, let you share files of almost any size securely and quickly. We use it here. You can access files from any computer or mobile device. Request files and have them dropped into a specific location. Email alerts, uh, which are fantastic. Control who has access to files, levels of permissions. Like this is serious, serious file control on a very granular level. And if you visit sharefile.com and click on the radio microphone button and use the promo code TWIST, which doesn't require a credit card, you get a 30-day free trial and you'll get our top 10 questions answered by investors. Yes, David Cohen, Joanne Wilson, Dave McClure, Steve Jervis, and Brad Feld, Mark Suster, and many more. So sign up for ShareFile, use the offer code TWIST, and then send us a request for a file to sharefile at launch.co, and we'll send you that awesome video. Thanks again to our friends at ShareFile, and go ahead and say thank you at ShareFile on Twitter for uh, them sponsoring the program. All right, moving on. Uh, we got Bitcoin. Let's do our, um, our Bing launch of the week. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm going to give you guys three uh, of the launches that happened this week. You're going to give me feedback on them. So the first one, uh, Uber launches 
uh, rush service in New York where you can watch a bike messenger go from point A to point B. Price is 15 bucks within a zone. Uh, or it can go up to like, uh, it's $5 more, I think, for each additional zone, so maybe 30 bucks to go from the bottom of Manhattan to the top. Uh, most things can be delivered within an hour. Uh, larger play as a transportation company is what most people are saying, or perhaps even this is the beginning of the Uber uh, transportation API. Uh, what do you guys think of Uber Rush? Surprised it didn't happen sooner. I mean, I think people have been expecting this for at least a year, year and a half, but uh, this is a logistics company, right? Yeah. I mean, this makes total, total sense. So you view Uber as a logistics company, not a cab company? <laughs> Definitely. They don't view themselves as a cab company right. either. Uh, what's interesting, they just, uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, they started charging the cabbies $10 like a week for their data plans. I, I very saw some aggrieved tweets about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway. So that oh they're charging ten yeah. bucks to have the phone in your car I guess yeah, yeah for, or the, for data the data plan, plan. yeah it's very that's fascinating I wonder why they did that and the the other interesting thing about uh, Uber is that you know they're gonna end up buying quite a lot of hardware they buy already buy a ton of phones and this company yeah. is gonna go global thousands so of phones yeah and well m many many more tens and of thousands yeah. it may, and maybe hundreds of thousands eventually uh, and other kinds of hardware too so you have it's funny all the OEMs and including Apple and Samsung everyone's kind of trying to get a piece of that. Uh, that's something uh, we wrote about recently. Yeah, Samsung. you said they're talking to Samsung. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So we'll uh, that would be interesting. I get the Samsung S5 in there, or whatever. It'd be like half the price, maybe, or a third, or two thirds of the price. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think of Uber as a logistics company? Definitely. I don't know if it is that yet. I think it may it may want to be uh, that it, it's a. But in ter in terms of actual delivery, it's a natural extension. Uh, I let me give you an example. I sent a, a Nexus Five phone uh, to my father. It's going to arrive uh, in New York today, uh, and I. Uh, uh, send it even, even though it was more expensive via UPS as opposed to the postal service because I like to be able to track exactly where it is and I mm -hmm. trust UPS more and so just being able to s uh, send something uh, in a metro area and be able to track it and know that I'm, I'm getting real time data that's really nice I want yeah. it out here I, I think the bike messenger thing is particularly brilliant because if you look at bike messages in New York having lived in New York for three quarters of my life it's very scary to give your package to a bike messenger mm -hmm. and it's very hard to find out if your package got there or if they're in your building looking for you. Because bike messengers were like a certain contingent of interesting people. I'll just sort of put it like that. Like, you know, if you're a New Yorker, you know, like you would walk through a cloud of weed to get through the bike messengers. <laughs> like, there, there's a certain lifestyle to bike messages. There's a whole like, movie. There's an action movie about a bike messenger. Is there really? Right? Yeah, yeah, From the 80s? <laughs> no, no, it's recent. Oh, it's really? Recent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so those guys are amazing, but um, it was sort of also like, you, you, you sort of like, I don't know if dad's going to get the Nexus, right? And so I just think it's particularly brilliant for them to do bike messaging because they have such trust in the brand now from the performance of the drivers that um, Premium Rush was the movie. Thank you, producer Gina. Premium Rush, for those of you, you um, who haven't seen it, it's got 1.5 stars on <laughs> Netflix. Um, so they're actually taking that reputation and then layering it onto an area that had low reputation. And like you're saying, you actually would pay more to get a little bit better service and yep, reputation. I did. So, and full disclosure, I'm an angel investor in Uber, which everybody knows because I high five about it every day of my life. We haven't even talked about the, the B2B applications that yeah, Uber what is can that? think B2B? about, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're dealing with the consumer uh, market now, yeah. but and, and the bike messenger thing starts to get into what businesses need, right? Ah, as yes. well. So there, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes that you know as consumers never see. So, the end, uh, endless possibilities. For what this what is the Uber API that everybody is like talking about now? What do you? Because I don't actually ask for any information on the company because as an investor I don't want to know. When did Google, you invest, by the way? In the first round. <coughs> oh, okay. Uh, um, so uh, pretty ridiculous. Yeah, I know. Um, so I, I basically don't ask for information because I don't want to people to ever say like I was a leak or something because I'm kind of a quasi journalist hosting a show. I write sometimes. So I specifically have no information. But what do people mean when they say Uber API? I'm what do you sure. think? I keep hearing this over and over again. There's going to be an Uber API, Uber API. I never heard the, it from Uber, but... Okay, to, to, to basically, so basically spread their technology even yeah, further. Yeah, so like imagine you were... A, you wanted to create a service, like you were a restaurant. I guess what the way it was explained to me, like let's say you're a local restaurant, you have 20, cha you're a chain of 20 restaurants, or maybe you're a chain of 2,000 across the country. You make your own app, mm -hmm. and instead of having Domino's pizza drivers anymore, you just hit the Uber API, and they pick it up, and they drop it off, and that's it. And you like embed the Uber API Technology. code into your your app. So now the entire logistics of your company goes, wait, so let's say you were the cupcake 
one of those sprinkles or cupcake companies, and you, all of a sudden you have 15 locations, and you want to do cupcakes on demand. Well, you just go to your app developer and say, yeah, our existing app that tells you the menu, just put right. this in here. Right. And now you've got sprinkles app. I want these cupcakes, and all of a sudden you see them coming to you, powered by Uber. Yeah, it's and th there already are companies that are that are trying to do this, right? Yeah, um, there are. You've got, you mean you've got Postmates, right? That, that's out there. There mm -hmm. are companies that are they're not specific for one yeah, type of service. Yeah, TaskRabbit, I guess. But they, yeah, they they try to offer yeah. this to to any well, business. Postmates said on the program they were eighty five percent or ninety percent food. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, so I kind of feel like I mean he said that on the air. It wasn't like a. Kind of but if they do, if you do it right, uh, you, you're going to have to deal with things like maybe user accounts, and uh, but this, this yeah. is something that any competent app developer can handle. Uh, but it, they can do not just uh, uh, things like will will handle the delivery. They can also give you things uh, a, a like uh, logs of how long it took, basically statistics. Uh, this is this yeah. is how long the delivery delivery is going to take, and then you can pass that immediately back to the user. And so you have to trust them a lot that they're going to be in business and not and not go away in two years. Mm. Uh, but it's a nice API if it happens. Well, this is also like they've tried like deliver a. Um, I did the deliver ice cream sandwiches in LA, and they had the kittens, and they've had other things, roses. But this is the first one that I guess is not a like one-off, like it's going to go away. This right. is like I, I'm pretty sure this is permanent, right? Yeah, this yeah, is like yeah. a permanent fixture now. So hey. and for the next show, I expect you to do some reporting in the meantime. Tell us about the API. When's that coming? Yeah, no, I'm not going to so. do any reporting. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's just the thing. As a former journalist, like I don't want to do any reporting. I just give opinion. That's it. Um, it makes my life. You did some easier. reporting for your Google, uh, your Google writing, though I could tell. You well, did, you did sometimes a lot of in my Google writing, it's sort of like I'm at a bar with somebody who, or you know, works for Google, mm -hmm. or used to work for Google, mm -hmm. or is a partner of Google. So, do you consider that reporting, or just me, like shooting the shit with my friends, right? right. Like so. Like I'm surprised you didn't talk about the, you know, the Google currency when we were talking about cryptocurrency earlier, yeah. right? That's that yeah. seems inevitable. So. Do you think they'll do that, Google uh, currency? I'm sh they try everything, right? They try everything. I guess so. They got Orchid and everything, yeah. And now they're actually doing delivery. They have like some. Do you guys ever use that Google Express? Is Shopping Express all the time. You do. Oh yeah. How did? How is it? Uh, it is. Uh, well, they outsource delivery to 1-800-Courier, right? So I live on the San Francisco Peninsula, west of the 280. And so eBay does, um, uh, does not, and Amazon do not service our neighborhood, but, but Google does. Uh, wait, wait, west of the 280 or east of the 280? Uh, west of the 280. West of the 280. Uh, correct. So it's, 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 it's semi-rural, right? Yeah. Uh, but Google Shopping Express delivers. So if I order by approximately 3.30, I'll get it the same day. And it's, it's from, you know, the Whole Foods and Costco and, and, and stores. That, uh, it's uh, free. It's, uh, it's 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 free for the first six months, and then after that, it's something like five dollars per store per delivery fee, which covers my cost of gas. If I were to drive down uh, right. to Costco, uh, it's 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 pretty good, except that one eight hundred courier, you don't always get the same guy, so maybe they'll leave it at the neighbor's house on occasion. Then you have to scramble to find it, but um, but it works well in about ninety percent of cases. They're advertising it a lot. I, you know, we're doing a podcast here for people who listen to radio. It is oh, blanketed the radio with Google Shopping in the really Bay Area, absolutely. Yeah, so that's interesting. Like the, you have Google Ventures did the last round at Uber, mm -hmm. and then they're I guess quasi competing or dipping their toe in it on the other side. What do you think of that when you see that? Uh, Google Ventures invested yeah. in them, and then you have yeah. Google Corporate doing like deliveries. What do you think when you see Google doing like both sides of the fence? They're investing oh, I, in things and competing with them. You know, I, I think actually with with Uber and, and we did a we did a, a long article on uh, on Google Ventures and, and Bill Maris in particular, yeah. who really stays behind the team. You don't see him at any parties, but he's no. he's a big player now. Um, that deal, the Uber deal that the Google Ventures did, was premised on synergies with Google. Ah. Uh, they talked about that. That's very That's how openly. they sold it internally. And, yeah, and in fact, uh, there was an uh, arranged meeting between uh, the Uber uh, management and the Android team. I, I I mentioned, ah, uh, I mentioned the situation with, with them the thinking about going into Android and, and maybe maybe using an Android uh, hardware vendor. They, they also talked to the Android team as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for them well, to work together. Well, you also have the self-driving cars, which is like right. the seven, which is the seven, maybe the ten-year opportunity. Exactly. So you have the ten-year yep. opportunity, and then you have all the other uh, little ones. And producer Gina says she actually used it um, to send Liz Gaines her headphones one day. Mm -hmm. um, all right, um, the new college slash grad school, Flat Iron Code School. Uh, in New York, I'm assuming, raises $5.5 million. New York's Flatiron School aims to turn students into professional programs in three months, accepts 10% of applicants. Tuition costs $12,000 for three months, so it's $1,000 a week, but the school refunds 4K if they accept a job offer at one of their partner employers. Ah, so then it would go down, I guess, to 700 bucks a week, which is still crazy. Well, it's 100 bucks a day, 125 bucks a day. It's expensive, but not cheap. Um, all right, let's see the video. The point of technology isn't to help ourselves, it's to help others. Um, which means you need a diverse and vibrant economy. 
the more and more people that graduate from our program, the more it's going to inspire other people to realize what their life can be, that they really can do and create everything they've ever wanted to do. There's thousands of ways to write a program, and in each of those little differences are our individuality, and we want to celebrate that. You know, the hard part about programming isn't how good you are as a coder, it's how good you are as a person. After our students get hired, when we're talking to their employers, okay. they ask us, where did you find such great developers? And the answer to that is that we didn't find great developers. We found really great people, and we just told them how to code. We're crying here. Everybody yeah. has to have one of these videos. <laughs> They're teaching people how to do, like, Python. Right. And all of us are tearing up in here, like... Does every startup now have to have a video that feels like they're saving the planet? I mean, it's... Even before they launch, they have to have yeah, something no, like... like Clink have you seen the Clinkle commercial? I mean, the Clinkle video makes me feel like they've won already. Yeah, no, not, not quite. Not quite. I mean, it's three years yeah. in. Get me... Yeah. Hey, Gina, producer Gina, let's get these Clinkle people on here, and I want to find out why they're getting so much damn press. I started it. By the way, I started it. Did uh, you Thanks really? a yeah. whole lot. Yeah. You're, you're welcome. I started it. What, yeah. What's the story with those guys? It's three uh, well, years I mean, in now, and it's supposed to change the world. What, what was really interesting is that they actually aggregated a, a large talent pool from Stanford, and so that's why they got noticed. Everyone was like, you know, dropping out of school, or like as soon as they were graduating, uh -huh. they're going into this thing. So that, that's why it's that's why I was company. interested. Clinkle is a payments, payments company. company, right? And they use the sound, uh, this clinkle clinkle noise, coins hitting each other as the the mechanism. Um, for and is money. it ever going to come out? You think? I'm, I'm sure it will. I'm what, sure is it, it going to be awesome, um, or is it, it going to be as awesome I, as the video? I have no idea. I think they need to solve their management problems first. That's what I heard. Uh, I heard the people anything are else. Now. Yeah, a lot of turnover. A lot of very high-profile people coming in, leaving like a week or two or three later. Uh -huh. So, but on Flatiron, so yeah, we're talking about to, these let's co go back coding to schools. These coding schools. But, weren't they? They were regulating them here now. There was yeah, the whole uh, thing about regulation of them because they're schools. That's right. So I wonder what what the situation is new, with New York on yeah. that. But but the main question that I have with all of these things, uh -huh. uh, I'm very skeptical when I see new schools come up. Not because I don't believe that they can be great, but where's the data? Do we have enough data? On to back, uh, up. To, to back up the the notion that, that these schools are worth the money, um, or are people really taking a chance at this moment? What no, I, I I I I hate to say it, but I'm going to be a skeptic here. Uh, I've been a programmer since I was about 12 or 13 years old, and uh, I, I've uh, dusted off uh, some of these uh, skills uh, uh, to. Uh, uh, to, to work on recent.io, and, and, you, and, and I've realized uh, that I'm actually a little uh, rustier than I thought. Uh, uh, but the point is that you have to spend something like 10,000 hours to be good at something, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I, I, I don't see how you can become a really good programmer in uh, three in months. months. I, yeah. you, you can certainly uh, maybe... Uh, 400 hours. Well, you, you can know your way around JavaScript, perhaps, but when, when Google and Facebook and Twitter... Is JavaScript uh, start re really programming? Well, let, let, I'm putting that aside for the moment. <laughs> uh, there's, I mean, it, I can, it write, is, I it can is write JavaScript. It, 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 it mean, actually is programming. It's, okay. it's, it's, a, it's a different, different type than, say, yeah. if you're writing assembly. Yeah. But it is programming. Yeah. But there's, you're, 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 you're not seeing Google and Facebook and Twitter recruiting from these camps. And they're, yeah. they're going to be recruiting from folks who have PhDs from uh, Stanford or MIT, or maybe if they're slumming Carnegie yeah. Mellon. So uh, $200 a day, if they have 10 students in the class, they're making... Yeah, ten thousand dollars a week. It's one hundred twenty thousand dollars for the. I mean, that's it's a better deal for the people running the school than for the it people kind of feels like going the through the school. Price gouging to me. And and, and I thought uh, the wait, whole. Do, I mean, is it price? Do we feel this is a fair deal? Uh, twelve thousand dollars feels extremely expensive for me. It, especially when you have you know Code Academy and other services that are that are free. And I I have I, I've started to use some of them. I've not actually gone through and and, and finished anything, but. Um, I, I thought the whole point here. I will stick to journalism. <laughs> I thought the whole. That. I thought the whole point here is that uh, you know every programmer likes to say, "Oh, I'm self-taught. I'm self-taught." Uh, if that's yeah. actually true, a lot of the good ones I know are. And there are all these tools that make it so much easier than it used yeah. to be. Uh, it's hard to it's hard oh. to see why the, why a school that you know you charge twelve thousand for is. There's uh, also a selection sense. bias going on here because if you really do love code, you're going to go to those. Uh, Code Academy and all these online tools and yeah. learn and go to an IRC and you can just go, you know, fool around on the internet and figure it out. Then the people who feel they need to go spend a thousand dollars a week are those people who can afford that. Therefore, are they people who really will become good programmers or not, Declan? Probably not. I, I'd, I'd be delighted to be wrong. Uh, Me but, too. But uh, when, when you can go through MIT's uh, core undergrad computer science curriculum online for free, mm -hmm. Coursera, why, yeah. uh, why, why pay yeah. uh, th this amount of money? It's, you're, that, that, that amount of money should be better spent uh, trying to bootstrap your startup if you're going that route or buying yourself a very nice development machine. Yeah. So how do you guys think it's different than a four-year comp sci degree at a crappy college? Because it does seem like it's city school is 3000 a year. 
I mean, I don't know. When I was supposed to go to Brooklyn College, it was twelve hundred. That was the late eighties. What does City College cost these days? Three grand a year. You're gonna make me look this up, aren't you? No. Anyway, I'm gonna say let's just say City College costs three grand a year, or four grand a year. It's the same price to go to a four-year school, basically, with plus or minus ten percent. So City College for computer science for four years, or Declan, did you did you go to school for programming? Um, yeah, yeah, I actually went to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, okay. the, that's what I was joking about, slumming. Uh, but uh, no, the, 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 you actually learn a lot in a rigorous um, a, a CS curriculum. Uh, you, yeah. you, you learn things that you're not going to uh, in, in just a, a three like month um, math. Uh, it, 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 well, I mean, computer science logic. essentially grew out of math, but yeah. you're going to learn about ways to, to think about not just uh, computer programming, but uh, as a science as well. You're going to l- learn about different types of algorithms and how qu- uh, how fast they are. Uh, th- uh, maybe they can fit all this in, but I think it's much more, here's how, how to write JavaScript. I'm going to start my own school, and it's going to be $120,000 for three months, and you're going to learn how to be an entrepreneur. Ten people. I'll make $1.2 million a even, quarter. Even if you go. got one person, that's a great start. Yeah, hundred. So. I bet you I could. <laughs> I'm sure you could. Man, i got to get my evil on. <laughs> okay, listen, all right, we saw that, okay. Uh, Midi Sprout, make music from the, oh, should I do a, um, should, uh, maybe I should do a commercial. Let me do a commercial. Uh, oh, it's not even a commercial. It's MailChimp. Oh, God, so easy. <laughs> right now, I'm just like, what? what did I agree to this? <laughs> Kyle Gattis is making monkey sounds. <laughs> listen. Uh, MailChimp is amazing. I've been using it for getting close to a decade now. Uh, 2,000 subscribers and 12,000 emails for free. If you don't have a mailing list, then you're doing it wrong. Even if you're like an individual like journalist or a blogger or you're starting a company, you need to start collecting emails. You better have it. Are you getting a email? Are you collecting emails on your website? And guess what I'm using? MailChimp. I am. Of course. And why would you use MailChimp? Because it's free and easy. Uh, yeah, and they work pretty well. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's the, this is how great they are. They give everybody, even if you're a startup, 2,000 subscribers, 12,000 emails a month free. And they recently did MailChimp 9.0, which is incredibly, incredibly beautiful. Drag and drop email designer that creates mobile-friendly emails. And let me tell you, mobile emails is a huge pain in the ass because of all the different, some people's using Mailbox, some people are using the native Apple client. It sucks to do mobile uh, email templates, and they solve all those problems for you. You can edit emails as a team in real time. I didn't know they had that feature. That is genius, just like Google Docs. Wow, that's like kind of even unnecessary. That's like, that seems to me like the 758th feature on the roadmap of somebody building this, and they got there. Uh, there's no contract. The free plan is always free. You guys know they're awesome. Go ahead and thank them at MailChimp. If you don't have one, just sign up for MailChimp, and you'll see how a great product is actually developed. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, back to our uh, Bing Startup of the Week. Mini Sprout, make music from... The Biofeedback of Plants. This is a Kickstarter, a large art installation tracked biofeedback of different plants translated into data to be played by a synthesizer, developed a small-scale prototype for people to play. People with synths or computer use at home raised nearly $25,000. We have a clip. MIDI Sprout is a biofeedback to MIDI converter that will allow anyone with a synthesizer or a computer to easily convert the biorhythms of plants and even their own bodies into music. We have developed a prototype for artists and collaborators for use in installations and performances, but we need additional funding to make the final product and get it out to people like you. We believe in the positive effects of biofeedback art on people. Creating generative electronic music from your house plants (laughs) can enhance your awareness of the world around you. Incorporating plants into musical performance can also generate ideas that humans could never produce, providing endless inspiration. (laughs) This is the beginning of the global DIY biofeedback movement, and we want you to be a part of it. Wow. Okay, producer Gina, if this is a Saturday Night Live skit or a Funny or Die skit and you cut the bumpers off or something like that, first of all, well played. This is an Um, April Fool's joke, right? Like from 10 days ago? I'm pretty sure... If this is on Kickstarter, I'm a little bit worried about Kickstarter's ability to filter do, projects. Do we know that this is legitimate? Well, is producer legitimate? Gina put it in there, so I, this could legit. I mean, I don't think producer Gina would punk myself and the guest. I think she would. Pr- she would punk the guest, but probably not me. <laughs> but it's datagarden.org. Okay, so they have a website. So if it's a .org, then it can't be fake. We know that you can't put up they a fake have, website. They raised or have, sorry, they have twenty four thousand dollars out of twenty five thousand dollars. Pledged on Kickstarter, right. uh, so it's, it, it could be a brilliant parody. 
Uh, it, or, yeah, it, or it could be an art project, or it could be both. Can I put myself on Kickstarter? Because yeah, I, if you're willing I would to love do a twenty-four thousand dollars. Video about the impact I can of biofeedback. Definitely on... do a pretentious video about anything. So all right, let me ask this question: Which was more pretentious, the video for the coding school or for the bio art oh. feedback of the neck plants? and neck, neck and it neck? It is kind of neck and neck. I'm though. siding with, with the with the plants here, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I think it's less pretentious because they're asking for less money. Ah, that's mm -hmm. that's a fair point. Um, all right, well. I, I'm speechless. Like, what can you really say? What can you say about this? You can't top that. Listen, I, you know what? I currently live in Los Angeles, and I'm moving to San Francisco, and I'm a New Yorker. So, like, I'm skeptical of everything. But after 10 years in LA, I believe that anybody would fund anything <laughs> because people there are like taking crystals and rubbing them on their foreheads. It, it's like everything is like, let's go eat raw. Let's drink raw milk. And there's like huge riots in the street about raw milk in Los Angeles because. The cops are busting. Right. That's right. in Venice. My wife, my, my, yeah. my wife is. I'm not gonna say she's gullible or anything like that, but she's believe. She's a believer. So we go to get raw food at this place, and there's like raw cheese and raw milk. And the only difference is it's got tons of bacteria, and they charge three times as much. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through this like back door to get to the raw milk and the raw cheese, <laughs> and then it's like for dogs only. I'm like I really don't know if I want to drink the milk, but it says for dogs only. But but you're burying the lead. Why are you moving to the Bay Area? Te <laughs> Ten years in LA, I kind of. The only reason, reason I moved to LA was because I fell in love with my wife, and I just needed a break from New York. Um, but I'm up here literally every week for two or three days, and it's exhausting me. And then I got a four-year-old, so then she's like, when she was one or two, my daughter would be like, "Oh, you know," she didn't know I was leaving. But now she's like three or four, and she's like holding my leg as I walk out the door, and then FaceTiming me. Please come home. Please come home. I want to watch Frozen again with you. You know, I'm like, okay. She does the FaceTime herself. It's um, no, she'll. She, my wife will initiate the call, okay. but she's pretty close to, and she'll okay. hold it now for ten minutes, you know, and talk to me. So, um, it, that's the main reason. And also, I'm angel investing, and like, so the opportunity here with I have that ten million dollar launch fund, and then they I did my first angel list syndicate, and it turned out to be. I put fifty thousand dollars in. I can talk about it now because it's closed. But I put fifty thousand dollars into something called Calm.com, which is like mindfulness meditation, which I'm kind of really into. I've been doing it for three years, on your phone, and they've got a large number, like thousands of people subscribe for ten bucks a year. So I put fifty in. A friend of mine, high profile entrepreneur, puts a hundred in, and then I put it out to the syndicate for two hundred, over three hundred, and you know I got a million dollars in my syndicate. So now I own roughly like ten percent of Calm.com. Mm. Which I take kind of seriously. Like now, I'm like I'm almost like a little mini VC. So it's kind of a big opportunity. I, like my leverage for my fund, I usually put in 50k, is now 7x. So it's kind of like turns a 10 million dollar wow. angel fund into a 70 million dollar angel fund. And I don't know if you saw Hunter Walk's piece on Gill, who's got the largest syndicate from yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So and this, there's your competition. Like, yeah. Well, what is it like no. for, you, for journalists to have competition no. from uh, VCs? Well, I, I don't view them as competition. I mean, yeah. we, you know, we're a subscription model. Yeah. We're we're very focused uh, for a certain but audience. Identity but evidence now. But at, in general, yeah, yeah, absolutely. In they're, general, they're fighting for audience. Absolutely. No, you're 100 percent right on on the you know the the, the free news side of things. Um, absolutely, the the game has opened up. Everyone's trying to be a brand, um, and yeah. It's getting the the audience is being splintered. Um, I don't know how long that's going to last. I don't know how much investment all these VC firms can can make in becoming a brand. Maybe right now they can. When the cycle changes, I think point. that's the first thing to go. It's a little annoying, isn't it, though? Well, it becomes it's... difficult, though, because where, where are you going? What site or service is going to be your homepage for the internet? It's not Yahoo anymore, no. if it ever was. No. But uh, but do you really need a journalist? Uh, maybe not you, because because you're 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 not a, a, a free publication. You charge quite well. Thank you very much. Uh, it's for, only a dollar a day. It's just like a couple of Uber rides. It's really so. it's like like twenty cents per you per day. So it's, <laughs> yeah, it's the way I mean, I if you put it. it down to per hour, we're talking about pennies. But mm -hmm. in any case. It, it, or do you really want to go to free news sites and have them regurgitate and probably make some errors in re reporting or rewriting what the VC said? No, maybe right. just go to abc.com instead. Yeah, that's right. Mm. All right, let's pick our winner here. Uh, we saw three amazing or interesting <laughs> startups. Uh, one is uh, Uber Rush uh, bike messengers in New York who are probably uh, not stoned, and you know where they are, and you know where they're going to pick it up, so it's going to be a lot better experience than a bike messenger in New York. Uh, Flatiron is charging people an absurd amount of money um, to go to school for 12 weeks, uh, and they may or may not come out capable of writing code, uh, TBD. And then Midi Sprout, yes, you've been waiting for it, Declan, for so long, and the day is finally here that you can hear the sounds coming from your ficus. Uh, which one? <laughs> Walk me through each one. Amir, you'll go first. Walk me through each one. 
Uh, I'm not and, sure this is a fair fight here. Okay, but just walk me through each one. Give me your thinking as to give me your number three, your number two, and then build up to your number one. Oh, man. So um, number three in third place is? In third place, uh, we'd, we'll have to go. Well, uh, again, to, to Declan's point, I mean, if, if, if we think, if there's a chance that all these uh, coding schools that charge uh, a lot of money are exploitative, then, then number three would be, you know, the coding school, mm. uh, followed very closely by the uh, biofeedback um, music of right. plants. So then your big um, winner is by default. Uh, by default, it's Uber. I'm not sure this counts as a, as a, you know, yeah. As I a think startup. Is that, people, actually, what's going to uh, happen is people are going to say like, oh, Jason, you stacked the deck. I just so you know, <laughs> I knew who the three launches were when I, like, turned the page in my show notes. Like, Jana, you got to put them up against something, you know, that's kind of like. You're right. It's not a fair fight. Declan, take me through yours. No, I, 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 I'm going to probably uh, follow the same line of thinking. I mean, uh, in terms of the Flatiron School, it's uh, you're, there's a gold rush, and you're the one selling supplies to the gold miners, uh, so you're guaranteed to get get some uh, cash as opposed to the gold miners who might be uh, might learn JavaScript and everyone moves to something else and they're out of and they're out of luck. Uh, there's I, I, I'm I, I'm I'm not a fan, but I'd like to be wrong. Uh, and uh, MIDI, MIDI Sprout, I mean, I, I remember going to a, a concert at Princeton 20 years ago, computer-generated music. It was they were using uh, next. It was over 20 years ago, next computers, yeah. uh, and it was pretty remarkable. Uh, and I so, mean, electronic uh, music is it, uh, inherited I, I the earth. I, it, it is computer generated music uh, th thumbs up but but uber for, for uh, in terms of actual practicality uh, that has to be the winner of course of course and I'm uh, the same uh, logic like I do and listen by the way for the people running the flat iron um, school or whatever like I we do think we're, we're having a little fun at your expense about the crazy video which made us all cry very and got us all really emotional but it does seem a little bit predatory but who knows? Well, what they should not. do, what they should do, and say they should say like, here's a graduate of ours who went to Google. Here's a graduate of ours who went to Yahoo, and so on. I, think but I, I don't think it's predatory. Uh, there's, I mean, I, look, I, I, as a capitalist, I mean, if someone wants to give their money to a for-profit yeah. school, uh, I, I, I think they, they might actually do. Um, it might be better risk reward ratio than giving money to a, uh, a, a third, a third-rate college or even a second-rate yeah. college. Okay, that's uh, fair. This is, uh, a graduate program that's not necessary. Exactly. Yeah. Basket weaving is not going to get you very far. Obama yeah. was right about art history majors. Okay. I kind of think it's a six thousand dollar program. At six thousand dollars, I feel pretty good about it. At twelve thousand, I just when it hits five figures, I'm just like, mm, feels a little bit. Anyway, uh, so there you have it. Thanks to our friends at Bing for sponsoring the program. Bing, Bing, Bing. Um, okay, the French are at it again. No after hour emails for the French. A little bit of a misrepresent misreporting in the Guardian. Kick this off. Initial report: New labor deal with French tech workers who are unionized. It says 35 hours per week. Max uh, includes uh, after hours emails. Legally binding will apply to French employees of Google, Pressware, Scoop, and more. What it really means is yes, there is an update to the labor agreement with an obligation to disconnect would apply not to the 1 million people the companies involved represent, but to the roughly 25% of independent workers they employ. Unlike typical workers, these contractors have flexible hours that are not governed by the 35 workers. Blah, blah, blah. Still, 35 hours a week, how European. What are you guys' thoughts on the disconnecting laws and this story? Declan, why don't you start? Oh, boy. Uh, this, it's, it's already difficult to hire fo uh, employees uh, of tech companies in uh, fr uh, France and Italy and so on because it's, it's difficult to fire them. Uh, and so uh, if, you're, uh, if you're Google and you're thinking of expanding in uh, your Paris office, which is a very nice location, by the way, right in downtown Paris, uh, the, uh, you might say well, maybe not because of this. I mean, change take, takes place at the margin. Uh, if if this, I, I know it. I, I know uh, according to the second wave of reporting, it applies only to contractors. Uh, but I think this makes uh, France less competitive. Uh, you you can't really be an engineer working on a mission critical pro um, product if you're limited to 35 hours per week. Also, speaking of making France uh, less competitive, I, I, th I think it was either this week or the very end of last week, the, uh, the new startup uh, minister, uh, technology startup yeah. minister, this is a person who killed the Yahoo Daily Motion deal right. uh, I mean, for no good reason. So, how do, Hold on a second. If I build a company, how does the government stop me from selling it to an American company? Th there was a stake that a, that a government-owned utility oh, had in that company. Got it, got it. Uh, so they, they, they had gave a right them to some block control. It. Yeah, that's right. Control. Okay, so it so, wasn't as unilateral oof. as like, yeah, right. okay. But I mean, still, it's. Uh, I it's mean, there are like state secrets. Like we don't allow people to sell stuff to Huawei or whatever it is in China, right? So right. there, I mean, there are there is some circumstance where you probably couldn't sell certain things. 
to certain governments. But, but not a, a video uh, site. not an open yeah video a site platform. stolen clips from movies. Exactly. Yeah, no. And and yeah. Uh, there is, a, in fact, a, a federal government task force that evaluates investment in U.S. companies, but it's things like port security and telecommunications, not email. Yeah, it's a little weird. Actually, you know, in a related story, but, you know, going off on a little bit of tangent here, Sweden is uh, testing a six-hour workday, and I guess this has to do with just labor in general, the, the evaporation of jobs. And I think the, the French thing maybe speaks to that a little bit, which is people are saying, like, hey, you know, maybe I should just get paid for the amount of work I do, and now people are saying, like, hey, there's not enough jobs, so maybe if we reduce the work day to six hours, what do you guys think about this sort of um, trying to solve the edu the trying to solve the employment problem creatively by either shortening the workday, therefore you need more employees, or minimum um, uh, salaries for everybody, like this concept of everybody gets like a guaranteed thousand dollar a month salary, uh, and you get rid of all the programs in the country. Have you guys been following this kind of like discussion? Uh, I, I just came back uh, late yesterday from uh, Maui. Uh, it was a, a great island vacation, and uh, there's it, it's it's kind of tempting to say I'll sit on the beach and be a professional bum. Uh, yeah. There's, uh, but the problem is that the most talented employees are, are the, the, these A employ A level employees that people like talking about, and uh, they're going to be the ones who are uh, the smartest and most motivated, and, and they're out uh, to uh, make their fortune or out to make an impact in society, and uh, they're they're the ones who are going to be willing to work the long hours. Yeah. I mean, especially for, for programmers, often it's uh, it's fun, as long as you, you get to control what you're doing to a large extent. Yeah, I think they're going to apply this to, like, teachers and bus drivers and, you know, other jobs that maybe people aren't in it to, you know, make a windfall of stock options. Anyway, interesting stuff. Um, so moving on, healthcare.gov uh, drove a cabinet secretary out. Um, so Kathleen Sibelius, uh, is how you pronounce it? Is that right? Sibelius. Sibelius. Um, she promised to stay to ensure that the signups for Obamacare were increasing. And I, did they hit six or seven million or something? Over seven, yeah. Over seven. So, and how I, many? But how? What percentage of those actually paid? Is there a difference between uh, signing up and writing a check? Ah, and uh, there they're might not be a thirty percent difference. Uh, mm -hmm. Not so far, I believe. Not so far. Mm -hmm. So they will at some point. But I guess being on between two ferns worked. Uh, obviously, it was a little <laughs> bit of a botched rollout. Um, but they seem to have solved it relatively quickly. Doesn't every website um, should work? have the, should have the NSA? run that Work website. It would have worked so, a lot better, I'm sure. Um, I mean, looking back on this, like, how should they have done this better? And is this ultimately a good sign that government got a, a functioning website eventually? Like, I kind of look at it and I'm like, if we're all going to get a website working, if it takes a couple of months, that's kind of typical in our industry, too. Well, it's been half a year, not just yeah. a couple months. Uh, yeah. There's, I mean, I, I think that she should have probably resigned uh, early on in the process. You do? Uh, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the buck has to stop somewhere. Right. And uh, if, if it's a disaster, and it was, uh, then uh, then wh why didn't she leave half a year ago when, when the disaster became apparent, as opposed to sticking around mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, probably talking to some large pharmaceutical companies about being their lobbyist uh, when <laughs> she leaves? I mean, it's, it's what always happens on both with both major parties. Uh, but uh, the the, uh, the problems with health with, with Obama Obamacare are not so much just the website. I mean, you, you can always have launch problems. I think that the problems are that it was rushed into law without people even knowing, uh, this is Nancy Pelosi's famous quote, what, what it really did, and we're seeing some of the problems now. Any thoughts, Amir? I'm so bored by this whole thing. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of over it, I think. I just uh, feel like we did this whole thing. This whole thing is, I feel like, stupid. Like, we should have just made, like, the, what do they call it, single? Single payer? Is it single payer? Like, everybody, just the government gives a certain level to everybody. And that's it, and it's done, like Canada and France do. I would have rather just that. This is kind of weird to force everybody to get insurance who doesn't want it or whatever. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm more excited about um, health-related startups that are working here and saying, you know what, let's try to, to the extent that we can, circumvent um, yeah. uh, everything else that's going on. Which one is uh, your favorite? Do you have one? Oh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about everything from interesting biotechnology companies to companies like One Medical that try to make the experience a lot better. Oh, yeah, it. I heard about this One Medical. Have you gone yeah. to one of those? You know, I haven't. I haven't. I've spoken to people who, who've had good experiences. And what did they say? What, what, how's um, it no, it's just easy. You can, you know, sign up, get an appointment very quickly, and, and be able to communicate, you know, with your with the office and with your physician They're very easily. They're going to the doctor. Yeah. It's, it's a walk-in clinic that be feels... Better software. Yeah, it's a walk-in clinic with better software, and the appointments actually, from what I understand, start. They're guaranteeing your appointment will start on time. Mm -hmm. So this idea that you go to the doctor and you could be in there for 15 minutes or three hours, over. Like you have your 20-minute window. You're got a cold. You're, you're you come at one. You're out by 1:20. Yeah. 
Anyway, so uh, Comcast is planning a Wi-Fi-based wireless system. Amir reported this in the information. Tell us, what, what is this about? Oh, yeah. So Why we, is it important? We've been writing a lot about uh, big changes to come in the wireless industry. So if you care about the wireless industry, yeah, whether you're a developer or anyone else, you should subscribe. Um, Just so you know, it's only like one eighteenth the price of going to... Uh, any conference. Any, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Maybe or, or to, going to your to conference. School. Or going to school. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, so a, a lot's happened with Wi-Fi uh, over the past few years. Wi-Fi still gets a bad, bad rep, right? Yeah. Pretty bad rep. Um, but actually, the technology has improved. Uh, these big Wi-Fi access points have improved significantly. They're getting um, better. They are. They are. And and you know, it's been interesting to to. How do they? How are they improving the number of people they can handle? They, the hand yeah. up between them. I, exactly. And and also being able to concentrate the signal in yeah. a particular place as opposed to dispersing it into like a you know a building or a wall or something. Yeah. But really pointing it in the right direction. Direction. Um, a lot of big improvements and a lot of vendors that that are that are very good at this. Um, but what's happening now? I don't know if you noticed, but Comcast for the past few years has, has been working on building a giant Wi-Fi network. Yeah. And ostensibly, they were saying, "Oh, it's for our subscribers to have internet wherever they go." I'm a Comcast subscriber. Um, I have not seen any advertisements for this. I live in the Bay Area here. Right. Um, it's certainly so not something that... So the idea is if you have it in your home and you put their router in, it automatically allows anybody to piggyback on your individual router. So, no, no. What I'm saying is that they've been, they've been, you know, they have a lot of SMB customers. Uh -huh. They're able to install a lot of Wi-Fi access points in public spaces. Got so it. ostensibly they're saying, oh, if you're a subscriber, you can go to, you know, Union Square and get service there for free if you're a mm -hmm. subscriber, right? You don't have to worry about your mobile plan. You don't have to spend money in your mobile, mobile data plan. Um, but what, what's really going on here is that they're, they're building this giant Wi-Fi network so that eventually, one day when it makes sense, they can actually turn on a full-fledged voice and data plan to work with wow. your cell phone, right? That's what they've been doing. Yeah. Um, and that's that's kind of the big news in that, you know, they are, they're a massive company, not going anywhere. Whether or not this merger works out with Time Warner Cable, uh, Comcast is here to stay. I know well, they they're- They print money. They print well. Yeah, they they, they don't. Have, they're not. Uh, they have their issues. Uh, there are some cord cutters, but they're they're generally successful. They're losing so, a million people um, a year. So so if I'm in the middle of San Francisco, this mm -hmm. will probably work pretty well in Union Square. But if I'm driving down the 101 uh, right. or across the Bay Bridge, how's this going to work? Right. So um, when you're when you're driving, for, first of all, you're not going to use that much data. Maybe you're going to use voice, a lot of voice. Yep. Um, they but they still a, a few uh, a few. K per second. Absolutely, absolutely. What, what's interesting about Comcast and Time Warner Cable and Cox Communications, another cable company, um, is that they basically have uh, an agreement with Verizon. They can use the 4G network whenever they want at wholesale price. So that's the supplement to uh, the Wi-Fi data. So they, they got a backup plan. Exactly. Well, it, it's all it's all a combination, right? And this it, this all together, if you put it together, is yeah. a full fledged uh, wireless carrier. Let me ask you guys this: Have you turned off Wi-Fi recently? because you knew by turning off Wi-Fi, your 4G connection would be faster. Like, flip, mm. you're, you're on your phone and you're on Wi-Fi and it's like, this is so damn slow, and you turn off 4G, but the, uh, the 4G works faster. Gina's saying she has. Yeah, that, I, I, only only occasionally, only at conferences. Yeah, like at conferences, I've been, but I've been yeah. seeing this happen more and more. Like I'm you know, using, I don't know, some Wi-Fi at a hotel, and I'm like, my God, this Wi-Fi is terrible, and I just paid 15 bucks for it. I turn off my 4G, it works better. Right, and AT and T, you know, I have the I'm a AT and T is my carrier. They automatically switch you to AT and T Wi Fi if it's within range, and your Wi Fi is on, and it's usually worse than right. the mobile network, than the cell tower network. So I actually have to switch switch it off then. Yeah, see, I think that's that's kind of interesting to me is like, if I think in urban places we're going to see 4G become like the same way cord cutting seemed like irrational 10 years ago, like how would you get TV? And then it's like, oh, well, I have Netflix and I have Hulu and I, you know, BitTorrent and stuff I can't get there or iTunes it. You know, like now it's going to be like, oh yeah, why would I get a cable modem at home? I, I got 4G and I can, you know. Well, the, the interesting thing about Comcast is that they are taking your Wi-Fi router and dub and ha making that double as a, you know, public as a Wi-Fi public access point. They have, I think, already several million of those. I think that's um, what... Google's doing with the fiber program, which, yeah. I, you know, I wrote, yeah. like, I think this is a takeover plan, not, like, a test. So, last week, that's what we, we wrote about Google essentially working on the same thing for their fiber markets. They want to be a wireless carrier, too. Yeah. Uh, big implications here. I mean, Comcast has a lot of advantages that, that Google does not have, because Google, if they want to supplement with a 4G plan, mm. they have to do these deals with carriers that hate them. Yeah. Uh, 
Comcast has a guarantee from right. Verizon that it can do this. So it has a huge lag up. Yeah. And I think it's a much bigger story than, than whatever Google wants to do. Uh, but when you think about Wi-Fi, if you blank an entire city with Wi-Fi, a lot of really interesting implica uh, um, uh, uh, potential applications for that, machine-to-machine -machine applications, where you can kind of control uh, all kinds of devices that are happening in that, in that uh, uh, region. But, so. but a, a question, the Comcast, so this is why I need to subscribe, clearly, and give you approximately 20 cents per day just for <laughs> you. Uh, there's... The, the Comcast piggybacking off of my router, that's, oh, that's only if I use their router with their default settings, uh, correct? And, and most people do. Most oh, people okay. do. I, yeah, yeah. I don't, I, but I, I, I did I not know that. I also bought my own router. I don't want to pay them for a router oh, rental. Same here. Most people are willing to do that, or they're not bothering to figure out that they can, you know, that they can actually get their own router. So Comcast is here to stay. I know that the butt of every joke that people make here in the valley, and especially in the wireless, uh, or excuse me, in the in the cable uh, space, but they are actually working on a lot of really interesting things. They're trying to work on a YouTube competitor, uh, mm. which we also wrote about. This is really really fascinating. Wait, wait, Google or a Comcast? A Comcast, rather. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, you scoff at that, right? It's yeah. easy to scoff at that, but they know how to monetize content. They do. They do. And they also have unique access to it because they own NBC. Yeah, it helps. So they have a little bit of content they could seed it with. Uh, breaking news while we're on the phone here. Uh, Amazon to launch a smartphone by June, according to Wall Street Journal. Expected to ship in September. You're on the monitor. We'll use retina tracking tech enabled in four front-facing camera sensors to make s images appear in 3D. Who cares? Um, what, do you what do you think of Amazon You know, now with the hardware coming out, the fire? This, you think they have like some, uh, you know, major ambitions, Declan? <laughs> major ambitions. I uh, mean, they're going really outside of their kill zone, you know? Like, I mean, it seems like phones a are hard. Phone. You know, th this phone initiative took them, I think, four years yeah. or so to work on. So, uh, and for a while, they, they desperately wanted to, do, to offer a phone for free without a contract. They couldn't actually get that to work economically. Hmm. So, it'd be really interesting to, to, to see the price point here. Does it say anything about the price point? Uh, I'm skimming the article at the Wall Street Journal right now. It doesn't. Uh, uh, it, you would expect uh, pretty, it would be low. It's, it's still it's still pretty uh, pretty big. Or maybe it's going to be j just like the Kindle ad supported. Uh, it's it's you know fifty bucks off or, or more uh, if you if we own your home screen. What I want to know as an app developer uh, is whether I can uh, install my Android apps on there without mm -hmm. a problem. And and what what about their app? is going to use the Kindle App Store? Um, how, yeah. how how, how close is it going to be to Android? If you use Android, you have to allow the Google Play Store. That's the rule, right? Oh, this is not going to be. I mean, as, as, as far as I know, this is not uh, an official Android product, right? They actually had a, had uh, talks with Google to uh, to Use offer it. the Google Play Store, to offer Google Maps. I don't think there was a deal reached. So it's a forked. Uh, so yeah, Android. it's still the fork, just like just like the Kindle Fire. The Kindle right? Fire is forked. Or, the, exactly. or the Fire TV. I think it's also Android based, right? Are um, these forked versions of Android going to fall far behind the like? Google one is Google going to like kind of cripple them? Uh, I, I don't I don't think so because I, I think Amazon is taking into account that it's going to have to do most of the work and it's a big company with a lot of resources so they can mm -hmm. most can't you're right yeah um, if if you're really you know just taking the open source version you're you're kind of screwed you can't really do that much with it but um, but I think no this is a fourth version a a Amazon does say that it's very, very easy to take your Android app and make it work on their platform. You don't have to do that much, and many are already compatible. Mm. I know that's their claim. I actually don't know if that's, in fact, true. Yeah, I think it pretty um, much works. Yeah. yeah. All right, another breaking news. Drew Houston, Drew Houston has defended his Condoleezza Rice uh, mm. appointment to the board of Dropbox, saying user privacy and rights will be at the heart of every decision. Will benefit from Rice's insights as Dropbox expands into more countries. Yeah, she's got some. Uh, this is from uh, my colleague Jessica, right? <laughs> the information. Uh, let's see what the link is. The link is um, well, we're linking directly to the Dropbox statement, actually. Oh, uh, but you guys may have covered it as well. And expands into more countries. Will users will continue to users are continuing to protest the appointment in the comments section of the statement. Uh, Declan, what do you think about appointing? you know, somebody who most people in the Valley would absolutely loathe and blame for the unconscionable, or what they would believe the unconscionable war that we did with Iraq. Well, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's why would you a, do that? It's, it's, it's kind of a litmus test uh, for, uh, um, uh, let me put, put it this way. Um, another way, uh, we, we saw the same thing with uh, Mozilla's uh, recently departed uh, CEO. If you, if you have not, if, if you are 
a Republican, if you're mm -hmm. a conservative, uh, if you have views that are not, not mainstream. I'm not a Republican or a conservative, yeah. but, I, uh, but I do like free speech. And so that, then let, let's just be careful uh, about yeah. the, uh, applying these litmus tests. In yeah. reality, um, Al Gore um, has uh, a history of supporting um, things like the clipper chip. Uh, l look at yeah. the Electronic Privacy Information Center's archives at epic.org. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You'll see mm -hmm. uh, this, was the, the, this was the Clinton administration's mm -hmm. first major t tech initiative. Gore was all over it, and it yeah. was building back doors into our electronic devices and he's on Apple's board and nobody cares. Uh, right. if, if, if Condoleezza Rice were a Democrat, would people be this upset? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, she, I know she's very involved in Stanford, obviously. She's not going to control the company. Yeah, she's, she's not going to control member. the board. She's a board member. She's just going to try to help where she can. And, uh, you know, uh, people seem to say nice things about her. She's supposed to be, you know, very intelligent, brilliant person. And, uh, yeah, she, you know, a lot of people uh, disapprove of, of, of the war and, and her, her role as secretary then. But, uh, um, I don't know. I mean, Marissa Meyer's on the board of Walmart, right? Uh, oh, and I'll, she gets black for that. I mean, I think yeah. people think, I think a lot of people think less of her because of that. Do you think that hurts her in recruiting? I no. mean, yeah. Zero, no, not at all. But I do think some people think, why are you on a company that will not pay a sustainable wage over here when, and, and, and she took that before she had Yahoo. So that was probably the right. best, most, that was probably the best offer she ever had in her life, right? In terms of visibility, like to join the Walmart board is incredible. So you can't say no. It's like joining the Disney board or something. Um, so she probably couldn't say no. And it was before Yahoo, but I think post Yahoo, she may not have taken it. But why mm -hmm. would you want to be associated if you're giving everybody free lunch and free phones and you've got this thing with people who don't pay a sustainable wage? Well, but uh, hold on. Let me rise to the defense. Yeah, well, I'm going to sound like a conservative now. Yeah. But I mean, Walmart also um, uh, opens stores that lower the prices so people who could not afford fresh vegetables yeah. now can. Uh, right. they, they, uh, they, they might. Um, th this, this has been a boon to the American economy by lowering prices. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and yes, may, maybe some small overpriced local stores can't compete. But overall, this is, this is a good thing for society. No, I know. I'm just talking about their hiring practice and the pay practices. Well, but let's, like, let's also look at the, look at the, bone, at yeah, the benefits, yeah. not just the negatives. No, I mean, and listen, maybe the concept is Marissa joins the board of Walmart to try to affect improve change. Improve it, yeah. And to improve it. So, you, you know. But I do think we're, are we entering a phase of, like, we're going to start putting our leaders in tech under a very deep microscope in the same way we try to like sort of annihilate presidential candidates and other candidates. Like, let's find your worst moment or the most controversial moment of your life and absolutely decimate you. It, it happened with Mozilla. Now, yeah. if you want to lead right. a tech company, you have to be absolutely boring. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I mean, M Mozilla is one thing, uh, you know, Google and, and Apple are, are another thing. But these people should be under a microscope. Th these companies are becoming more and more important, a bigger part of everyone's lives. Um, absolutely, everyone should be scrutinized to the max. And so, What's your take uh, in closing? We'll wrap up here, but it's it's still a lingering issue about, is it Eck is his name? Eek? Eck? How do you pronounce his last name? I think it's Eck. Anyway, the guy from Firefox getting, was being forced out, essentially. I mean, he said he resigned. But what's your personal thought on that? Uh, here? My personal thought is um, if you're the leader of a company, mm -hmm. the CEO, yeah. uh, your personal beliefs are very relevant to your employees, right? Um, especially if they're on hot button issues. Mm -hmm. And if it's going to affect your company's ability to recruit and att retain talent or attract talent, um, the, he can't de lead. the decision, yeah, the decision that was made makes perfect sense. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying his beliefs are right or are wrong, but um, yeah. Well, it, what do you? I mean, you think his belief is right? No. Uh, oh, okay. In, in well, general, then you should no. say that. <laughs> what are you um, afraid to say for him? He's, he's a reporter. Still. No, he should he still. So what? We're living in 2014. You should take a stand. Are you for or against gay marriage? Yes, uh, I, I am very much for. Uh, okay, then say that. Marriage. I but mean, um, uh, but but I, I'm not. You know, I, I think that. Uh, you Would know, you work we, for somebody who donated to Prop Eight and like was like a saying like I want to? Would you join a company like that? Uh, it, probably not. You pro so it would affect. Yeah, your it would absolutely decision. affect my my thinking and my decision. Yes, you want to you want to work for people you believe in, right? Right. Uh, particularly in tech, where everything's mission driven. So did you mission leave driven. because you didn't believe in Rupert Murdoch at the time? Uh, did that affect your decision? No, you know, uh, Rupert is actually um, there was a lot of fear, right? People, yeah. some people did leave. There was a lot of yeah. fear about him, but he's actually been really, really good to uh, to, to the journal. Has not really screwed with it too much, and has pumped a lot of money in. So. All right, Declan, you. What do you think about? Well, the let's have more lip. No, no, we need more lip. Uh, do, do you believe in the Second Amendment? Uh, do you own a gun? Well, I'm not I own a work for you. Uh, fantastic. So yes, a Second Amendment supporter, and uh, and I own a very to, large gun. So if anybody's thinking about hopping. Well, what, what, what kind of gun? 
I own a Ruger. I own a Ruger pistol. I, I, I kind of like Glocks, but I, but let's yeah. let's then maybe I will It'll or get won't the job work for done. you. How about if you're pro life or, or pro choice? Then I'm not going to work for you. I, yeah. I, I don't I don't like these kind of lit, 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 litmus tests when they don't affect the ability of mm. someone to do but their do job. But do you consider? So I guess this is where I think the issue gets. Uh, I think very confused because people are talking about First Amendment, like your freedom of speech, right? Mm -hmm. Which I don't think this is about. It's not like. You know, listen, West Baptist Church is, you know, telling, going and protesting Marines funerals. Like, they're the worst people on the planet. We're, and every, society seems to be like, okay, it's your right to protest, no problem. Even the people on the poor Google guys, you know, steps this morning or every other day, they're in front of some Google person's house. It's like, everybody's kind of like, okay. But is this a religious beliefs issue or is it a human rights, civil rights issue? And I think that's where people mm -hmm. kind of, th that's why this is so challenging. Is because you have a group of people who think it's a religious issue and they should have the right on a religious basis to believe what they believe. Right. But then you've got this other group, which I kind of fall into, which is like, Absolutely. I think this is a basic civil rights issue. Like, I don't really see it as different than women's suffrage or Birmingham and you know black people being forced to you know sit in different areas and people not sending their kids to school with black kids. I think that's how history would look at it. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I fall into the civil rights camp too, but... Um I, you know, I just think that this, you know, the technology culture prides itself on, you know, merit, trying to be merit, you know, meritocratic and, and trying to be uh, progressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we've we've reached this point, right? We're, we're past the tipping point. And, and those values might be intention. If you're if you're looking for the best program or maybe the best program where um, is a pro-life conservative uh, from right. Utah. That, that's different from the CEO, right? That's, I, that's, that's I, a completely why, but, why but is different? different. Why is it different? Oh, I, I, I mean, I, I know why. But, 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 why. but in this case, we have, I mean, he was the, um, Brendan was the CTO, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and he and it was the co-founder, inventor of JavaScript, and right. and and, uh, and right. the empl um, and there was no out outcry, and there was even a very I'll even say it was a pretty limited outcry in, in initially until he became the CEO. No, no um, he he never had any problems um, hiring and promoting mm. uh, lesbian and gay people employees. Knew. So what's the problem? Yeah. What was the problem? I mean, it's the outcry symbolic. the outcry is the outcry. It's happening, right? right. If right. there is happening, an outcry, yeah. then it's a problem. Uh, a problem that needs to be solved. But you also might, might have the pro other problem of uh, the conserv conservatives or pro-life folks may not want to work there or so be, be part of the foundation. I don't know if that's the case. I'm just saying that that, uh, that yeah. taking this kind of step uh, can have second order consequences you can't predict. Also, like, do you want to have everybody in your company have the same opinion about everything? Right. Right. And right. when it comes to civil rights and human rights, I kind of do. But when it comes to gun rights and pro-choice or not, like, yeah, I kind of wish people had the same position I have, but I, I don't actually impose it on anybody. This is why uh, CEOs try not to talk politics. <laughs> I, yeah, I kind of stay important. away from it. I, well, no, I don't actually. I take that back. Actually, I talk about it every week on the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I talk. You're not a shy person. I'll tell you, it's interesting. We got out of the last show after talking about this, and it was an hour long conversation mm. with the staff of my, like, three, four people from my company are like, hey, we got to talk about this. My, my feeling is this, my feeling is that. But I think he, this is why I think he's a bad leader. Because a bad leader could have turned lemons into lemonade in this situation. Because mm -hmm. he says he no longer believes that, and he did believe he he shouldn't have um, made the donation. So he he pulled back on it. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm 99 percent correct on that. He said he regrets that, right, Gina? Go take a look. But I think he said he wouldn't I have done it. I don't it think or, he did. He no? there was a blog post saying uh, I'm committed to equality, but I, I don't uh, think there was any backtracking. Hmm. KG suggestive. Okay, yeah. So he was suggesting that he still believes it, but maybe he didn't want to make the donation. Okay. Um, so, stands by the notion, but didn't want to make a big deal. Okay. So, I see if it's me as the leader, I would have said, listen, I love the team I work with. I love the mission of Firefox. I love what we're doing at the Mozilla Foundation. However, I, I realize I'm probably in the minority in this view, but I don't want to impose my will on anybody. And so, yeah, I donated to it, but in, in really thinking about it, if you want to get married and, you know, let's just let people do what they want to do. And, you know, my religious beliefs are going to be my religious beliefs probably till I die. But um, if you want me to stay, you know, look at my track record. And, but he, he wasn't public at all. He didn't talk to anybody. Right. You guys tried to reach out to him, I'm certain. Didn't everybody try to reach out? I mean, he didn't really make himself the, available. The, inf the information did not tackle this uh, uh, this pressing <laughs> uh, pressing issue. There, this is not a this is not a technology business. Um, uh, uh, so you story. you discussed it and specifically said we're not going to cover. No, it. No, no. We, we look. If we cover things when we have value to add. The information uh -huh. doesn't isn't just going to pile on and, and be the fifty first publication to Got say it. the same thing. If been. we can say 
something different or if we can add value with new right. information, we will. I got you, I got you. All right, listen, what an amazing show, great stuff. Uh, thanks, producer Gina, thanks, Jacob. Brandis, everybody, Gina uh, gets two thank yous. Declan, uh, great job on the show again. Everybody follow Declan M. And check out, uh, what's the domain name? Recent.io. Recent.io. Is it out yet or are you just uh, there's a, Give me a, another week or two for okay. an alpha and then a beta. But this is yeah. this is a news recommendation engine with Love an it. iOS and Android app. It learns from what you're doing. And uh, and you can uh, sign up to, to get an alert. And, and, pl and you can sign up to, to yeah. be on the beta. Oh, uh, and you can sign up at recent.io recent via MailChimp to get just into did. the beta. Fantastic. Go to theinformation.com if you can afford to pay the 400 bucks. Um, I got one complaint. I told Jessica this on the show. You ha When you send me the email, put the whole story in the email. To, to you personally? I'm a subscriber, yes. When you send the email. But you have the access. You can no, go I have to it. click. And then I got to go to a web browser. <laughs> then I got to log in my credentials or save them. It's, like, it's not how the world what works. What happens if it's a 2,000 word story? Fine, let me make that decision. What do you need to know if I click it or not? You just want to know if I read it. You know I opened it. Um, you just, just have this been discussed? No, no comment. No, I mean, I. I, I, okay. I yeah. Anyway, this is the way it should work. Just bring it back to the office, okay? All this right. is the way it should work. All right. I don't want to do the product design over there, but I mean, important people are on their phone. They want to just read it. All right, Bing, share file, MailChimp. Thank you so much for supporting independent media like this. And thanks to our new executive producers, Magnus Ingevarsen, Grow Dental, Marianne Halford, and producers Anthony Ortonez, Jeff Hoffra, I know him, Marcos Trinidad, Greg Meadows, I know him, Lisa Jones, Michael Peugeot, Jose Fuentes, Austin Miller, Will Paletto, I know him, Louis Eric Samad, James Schutte, and Shelley Gaskin. Thanks for supporting the program. Go to twistless.co. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. All right, good